So we're going to talk about Acts chapter 10, Peter and Cornelius. And the message this morning is around challenging the norm, doing things differently, following God's instructions, which may sound simple, but certainly not easy. When we are faced with difficulties in our lives, our normal and immediate reaction is to try and work out our own solution. We may contemplate and deliberate over different possible solutions. If that doesn't work, guess what? We may then turn up to the Lord for direction. And then when we do ask the Lord for help, we often present our carefully designed solutions and we make suggestions to God. Here's what I think will work, Lord. I just need you to answer my prayer in this way. But Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So how God views the problem that we bring to him is quite different, actually, to the way we perceive what's really going on. God knows the source of the problem and where it will lead to. So when we approach God in prayer, just remember one thing, and that is we are dealing with a God of magnitude. A God who formed the universe and the oceans and the sea that ebbs and flows. The tides come in and out. And, you know, just thinking there's a tide clock because it's so accurate. Every six hours the tides come in and they go out. And that's God. God orchestrates everything. He orchestrates the seasons, a season to sow and a season to harvest. And yet we are inclined to tell God how we would like things to be done. And I think it's probably because our minds can't always comprehend the magnitude of God. So if we put our trust in God, when facing difficulties, we'll find that. And now this is something I want to repeat to us. Everything that happens to us is in the providence of God and is woven into the fabric of his perfect plan for us. So the providence of God, of course, is his guidance and his purpose fulfilled in our lives. Everything, if we can remember, happens to us is in the providence of God and is woven into the fabric of his perfect plan for us. So as we turn to the scriptures this morning, I'm hoping that we could gain an understanding what it means to do things completely differently, God's way. And God's instructions work beyond our human rationale. Our reasoning is just based on the things our minds can comprehend. So Shelley has asked me this morning to expound on Acts chapter 10. Peter had to follow God's instructions and break away from the norm. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit this morning because this sermon, as I was preparing it, spoke to my heart. And there are things that I'm going to change and do differently. So because Peter obeyed, this brought a huge shift in spreading the gospel of Jesus to all the world. So... Acts 10 is about Peter and Cornelius. It's quite a lengthy reading. We might skip a few verses towards the end because we've only got limited time. Who is Peter, by the way, and who is Cornelius? Peter was one of the most influential Christian leaders in the first century after the resurrection. Peter was known as Peter the Apostle, one of the twelve. He was called Simon. He's called Peter the Rock. It was called Simon, Peter, Simeon, and Cephas the stone. But one thing, Peter did not believe in preaching to the Gentiles. 
That's the non-Jewish people. Peter was a very compassionate person and very loyal to Jesus, but he believed the Jews were ultimately only God, God's only chosen people. He also believed it's against the law for the Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. But God wanted to do things differently, to extend the gospel to everyone, the gospel of the risen Christ. Simple instructions, and we'll see why it was not easy for Peter. And now Cornelius was a highly respected Roman centurion, a commander of an army. Centurion is a hundred. So his army would have been at least a hundred. And he was a Gentile, but he adopted the Jewish faith. faith. And so we're going to read Acts chapter 1 verse 4 now. At Caesarea, there was a man, sorry, chapter 10, verse 1 to 4. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion which was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously, generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. So, um, do we have... Yes, yeah, so we've just sort of a caption of how it must have looked like. Um, must have been quite terrifying for Cornelius, but he knew that it was God. So then verses 5 to 10. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that happened and sent him to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. So we've got a little caption there. Um, it's how I just imagine it to be. Peter was a man of prayer. Then verses 10 to 12, he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was still being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heavens opened and something like a large sheet was let down to the earth by its four corners. It contains four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. That was a strange vision. Then we'll just read from verse 13 onwards. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything unclean or impure. The voice spoke to him second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, the men sent Cornelius, sent by Cornelius, found out where Simon lived. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them. That's, the Lord always confirms what he's saying. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come for me? The men replied, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He's righteous and God-fearing, who is respected by all the Jewish people. So then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Uh, the next day, Peter started out with them. Some of the believers from Joppa went along. The verse 24, the following day he arrived at Caesarea and Cornelius was expecting him. 
As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence, but Peter said, Peter made him get up, stand up, I'm, I'm just a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said, you're well aware, now listen to this, it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me, as he saw in that vision, nothing should be called impure or unclean. Um, then we go to verse 30, because, uh, yeah, Peter was just asking, why have you sent me? Uh, three days ago, then Cornelius explained his vision that he saw a man in shining clothes that said, Cornelius, God heard your prayer and remembered your gifts from, to the poor, and God had actually sent for Peter. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord commanded you to tell us. In verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I near, now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts every nation, the, the one who fear him and those that do right. And Peter began to preach to them. So I'm not going to read 36 to 43, because Peter um, began to preach to them and so I'll just pick up at verse 44 again. Peter was just telling them about the resurrection and the witness and, and all the um, things that he'd seen, Jesus. 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on him and heard the message. All who heard the message, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished of, at the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. This was God's confirmation that there was no distinction between Jews or Gentiles, and they got baptized in water. So we'll just leave the verses at that point. So Peter was instructed by God to do things outside the norm, outside his comfort zone. Peter's cultural and religious upbringing was actually a barrier to God's plans, such a barrier that God had to speak three times, a thrice-repeated vision. Do you know, we build barriers by believing things can only be done in a certain way and in a certain format, steeped in tradition. Prejudice, prejudice, and I want to bring that up quite a bit going forward now, can prevent us from hearing God's instructions. Now, prejudice. I'm from a Pentecostal background. I've been in a Pentecostal church for years where they um, speak, uh, speak in tongues in the services and they run the services quite differently. But I am here because God called me here under remarkable circumstances. So I had to put my prejudices away. And you know what? I feel God's presence here every Sunday. This is my spiritual home, regardless of the format. That doesn't matter. I see God in the singing. I see God in this music. I see God in the word. He's everywhere. He's in this place. So how does God speak to us? Through words, through visions, through dreams, events, circumstances that might arise quite unexpectedly. Sometimes the Lord impresses on your mind to do something. Or someone else may come along and confirm what you were thinking and say the same thing to you. So when God instructs you to do something and he speaks to you, you find that somebody else might come along and say the same thing. The Lord doesn't leave you on your own. So the scripture says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So what God said to Cornelius and what God said to Peter 
was in complete agreement with what God said to them both. So when we follow God's instructions, we will find that things will fall in place. So Peter invited some of the brethren with him to Cornelius' house. He didn't want to do it alone. He knew that the Jewish leadership would require an explanation. Why are you going to a Gentile's house? But it would have been more credible for the Jewish church leadership to hear from the whole group that went with Peter what actually happened there. And that the gospel was to be preached to everyone regardless of culture or creed. So doing something differently and departing from the norm and doing thing, things God's way can change the course of your life, actually, and the lives of others. So I was wondering, how do I illustrate this? This is a biblical, and it did happen, and it was wonderful, and it teaches us so many lessons. But I was wondering how I could illustrate how God speaks to us here. Yeah. So I hope Shelley doesn't mind. Um, Shelley's calling to this church. Now, I did not know how remarkable that was. And God doesn't make mistakes, and the calling was profound. So if we go back to this church, about a year ago, we had a search committee gathered regularly, and they asked for God's clear directions. And all had to gain consensus, which is completely biblical. We prayed in church. I remember Janet standing here and saying, oh, let's pray um, that the Lord sends a pastor to this church. Sunday after Sunday. After six to eight months, the people started wondering, why so long? But you know what? The Lord heard those initial prayers, and God was actually at work. I believe that God looked down on the congregation, his flock. Some were huddled together, some were distressed. The sheep are timid by nature and they're very vulnerable to predators. God also noticed this church that some sheep were scattered on the rocks, some had deep wounds, some had fallen by the wayside. And the Lord observed that this church didn't only need a pastor, they needed a shepherd. And in this case, shepherd is, and prejudice we all put aside, a shepherd is. Oh, wow. And the Lord had Shelley in mind. Someone to care, someone to put ointments on wounds, someone to nourish, someone to provide for God's flock. And the Lord also wanted to draw the youth back. So he had Sione in mind. So you see, God's plan is bigger than what we can think. So I talked to Sue Ellen Davis to understand how things had transpired according to this call of Shelley's. First, I didn't know this, the church, the church committee were tipped off to put out a call to Shelley in July last year. Shelley heard the call, but she was comfortable and in the norm committed to doing community pastoral work in Blockhouse Bay. That was a norm for her, but God wanted Shelley to serve in a different way. The call would have lingered in her mind because God was at work. And in the meantime, the applications came in for pastor to be a pastor, lots of applications. There were formal interviews um, and there were informal interviews. But you know what happened? <laughs> And to me, this is just no coincidence. A lot of the pastors that applied had pulled back their applications. They retracted it. The Lord was speaking to Shelley. So the second confirmation of the call, the Blockhouse Bay Church, where Shelley served under, underwent budget cuts. And Shelley's role was gone. She was made redundant. Was that a... Coincident? No. God was at work. The Lord wanted Shelley's service to him to be quite different to what she was doing. So the third step, the Lord spoke to Shelley again. On the 28th of November last year, Shelley ended in her CV. 
and ye are the, and that rest is history. But the Lord also spoke to Sioni, and a desire came over him to be near his children, and there was a job waiting for him. Above all, the Lord wanted Sioni with, to raise up the youth, provide hospitality and church and the home. And by the way, Sioni is a good cook, I believe. <laughs> And then God paved the way when Shelley accepted the call to the church. And it doesn't end there. This is just so amazing. They packed their belongings. They were ready to leave for Auckland. Apparently the truck was booked uh, for the Wednesday. And this was Backtrack Sunday. Now, they didn't have a house. And some people in this church, I don't want to really single out who they are, but they... Um, their mother died and she left a house last year sometime which they were going to renovate and rent out but for some reason they got so busy they didn't renovate the house and then it came to when Shelley was due to come they started renovating the house and they had just a couple of days to go so that was from May last year that house was standing empty so on the Sunday before Shelley left, the church folk apparently asked Sioni, have you got a house? Have you got yes, we've got a house. But they didn't have a house. He was talking in faith. And that Sunday afternoon, these people in our church rang them and said, there's a house. So... Yeah, that's to me such a miracle. So they moved, so moved into the house. So when we do things God's way, everything will fall in place and the circumstances will al align. So I just want to give you one more biblical example uh, just to embed it in your minds that God works in his own way. He's not interested in our plans and our, what we decide. So Joshua and the Israelites were were faced, faced a huge problem. And I've got their problem of epic proportions. It's in the sixth chapter of Joshua. What was their problem? They were on their way to possess the land of Jericho, which God had promised to them. But they faced massive stone walls surrounding the settlement. It was around about 8,000 BC, before Christ. And the walls were about 3.6 meters high, 1.8 meters at the base, a roadblock to entering the city. And there was also a tall watchtower around them, around it, 8.2 meters high. And they began to murmur, I'm sure. But sometimes we also face walls and barriers and we look and it seems like a completely impossible situation. And they probably had some solutions of what they would do. They didn't have any dynamite. They didn't have any machinery. But God didn't ask the Israelites for their opinion. Not even Joshua. He asked for their complete and unwavering obedience. Which involves challenging the norm. What would you normally do in a situation? No, they followed God's instructions. Let's put our solutions aside and challenge the norm. God's may, way may be quite different to what you figured might work. So the Israelites would have thought that maybe God's going to provide them with a battle plan. But there was no battle plan. Instructions were given to them. It seemed easy. To march around <laughs> but it sounded simple sorry I got that wrong it sounded simple but it was not easy so God instructed them as you know the story so well six days straight to walk around the walls of Jericho and on the seventh day they were to end with trumpet blasts and the walls would fall down step after step Nothing appeared to change. Now, put that picture into your own life. You pray and you pray and nothing seems to change. There was no cracking or crumbling of the walls 
And what did they do? They kept marching. If they'd stopped on day two or day three, or even on day six, they would have cheated themselves out of God's victory. So how do we keep marching in faith when the situation looks completely hopeless? Faith is simple but not easy. It's difficult to trust and believe that God is actually at work behind the scenes when we face difficult circumstances. We can't see what God's doing. He is at work. We just have to keep going. Take God at his word. And then eventually we know the story. They marched around the city and on the seventh day the walls fell down flat. Their victory in taking Jericho never hinged on their ability or their well-thought-out plans. So let me encourage you this morning to keep going. Let's not stop short of the victory, no matter what the situation looks like. You don't have to understand why, but just keep keep following him, because he is working things out. His plan for you is good. And he is to be trusted. But we might have to do things differently. So just to end on this, uh, well, just about ending. Power, slide 13. Um, Yeah, uh, there's a well-known saying, when all things fail, read the instructions. (laughs) About one out of five people read the instructions. Uh, Our minds just override the necessity. Our natures are, we want to be independent. We want to be self-sufficient. We don't want to be told what to do. And then, you know, halfway through making your table or whatever, you realize you've got the big screws where the small screws should have been on, and now you've run out of screws. (laughs) Or maybe we think directions are for idiots. And sometimes, if we ignore that little book of (laughs) instructions, or the slip of paper, we could have saved ourselves hours of time so it's the same when we follow the instructions of the Lord then lastly um, God says in Isaiah oh if you would have heeded my commandments my instructions then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea So the whole message really is, don't put any dependence on yourself. Put all your dependence on God. Trust God to take you through the turbulence. And I'm flying soon to far away on Thursday. But we have no problem in trusting an airline pilot and co-pilot if the aircraft goes through turbulence. Why? Why do we trust them? Because we have faith in their abilities. And yet, what are their abilities compared to the all-knowing God? So, a just seek counsel when you ask um, God, or God tells you to move in a certain direction. Just ask counsel. A wise man listens to counsel, it says in Proverbs. And the Jewish, and also remember to lay aside prejudice. Um, the Jewish people laid aside centuries of prejudice against the Gentiles. God knows where you're heading, and He'll choose the best way for you to get there. Lord, we confess that at times our hearts feel discouraged when we don't see immediate results from our steps of obedience. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us today that just because we can't see you moving, it doesn't mean that you're not moving. Thank you for the good plans I know you have for our lives. Thank you for leading us to victory. Please help us as we walk by faith and not by sight, day after day, step by step, choosing your way above our own. And now... May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give us peace this day and forevermore. Amen.